Hello there. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to say first again, make sure that everything is tuned in. Um, nobody's saying I've got audio problems, and then we will begin today's webinar. Now, do remember that Nancy Hopkin is going to give a presentation, and then after we'll have the opportunity to write any questions. Please feel free to write them down as we go so you don't forget them, or, uh, and they'll just collate and uh, we'll be able to. To answer those after the presentation. Um, and also, do remember, this is being recorded and it will go on our website, it will go on our YouTube channel um, for you to kind of keep us in all and resource and listen again or share with your colleagues. Um, and uh, we'll have that for even more. Just, I've got a question here, so I'm just going to make sure. Sound quality, a few sound quality issues. So we might um, just take the, we'll just talk very slowly, very clearly. We'll make sure I put right into the camera, uh, into the microphone. I'm off one side, but hope you and Leslie speaks um, should be right in front of it. Okay, yeah, no more, so that's fine. I think we're good to begin. All right, over to you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for joining me in this webinar. Um, a bit about me, I'm a landscape architect, architect and I've been largely practicing in design, restoration and management of the environment, including historic estates, which is my current work area. And my involvement with the Capability Brown Festival 2016 has de developed my understanding of some of the less well-known aspects of Capability Brown historic des designed landscapes, how important they are for wildlife, and for a wide range of environmental benefits that are well, less well known about. So this talk will summarise the expert knowledge and new research I've drawn together, working with Natural England colleagues and partners and specialists. And it shows how the parkland features Brown designed into his landscapes have created a wide range of habitats and species concentrated in one place, some of them very rare, including ancient trees and deadwood habitat of European significance. I'll also talk about how his landscapes support more than double the concentration of habitats and nationally protected sites for wildlife within them compared to the more intensively managed agricultural or urban land that surrounds them. I'll also talk about the fact that they provide oases or refuge for wildlife and stepping stones for species to connect with similar habitats in the wider landscape, thereby increasing their opportunity for survival on the broader landscape scale. In the second top part of my talk, I'll describe how his landscapes are relevant for us today, some 300 years on. They provide us with a variety of benefits for our health and well-being, and these include genetic diversity, regulating climate, water quality and water flow, offering us a sense of history, highly distinctive landscapes, as well as opportunities for biodiversity. And I will continue with some of my own thoughts on his legacy relative to Natural England's new conservation strategy to put his sites into the context of the wider environment. So um, my slides don't seem to be moving, Lauren. Oh, yeah, there we go. So first, um, Brown's design style. I'll just talk a bit about that. So you kind of get an understanding of um, what he actually did. So Brown helped develop a more naturalistic style known as the English landscape movement. And this aimed to emulate rather than dominate nature. And it was actually a whole new philosophy and approach that um, has since then has influenced our interaction with landscapes today. And before Brown, the fashion was for ordered formal landscapes influenced by the French and Italian style. And you may have been to Versailles, for example, with geometric gardens and water bodies around, around the grand house and straight avenues of trees and channel vistas. And you can see here in this slide at Chatsworth, um, the remains of the pre-Brown formal and ordered geometric design in the foreground. So Brown changed this by creating more natural looking landscapes on a large scale with informal natural looking lawns and parkland, serpentine lakes and rivers, 
or, and parkland trees and woodland, which were planted to shape spaces and frame views apparently naturally. He used subtle ground modelling in places to make his parklands appear smooth and gently rounded, and sunken fences or ha-has, so there appeared to be no separation between the grazed parkland when viewed from the house and lawns. So, because of him, nature and grazing animals were allowed to come right up to the house for the first time. He created extensive ridings and carriage routes around the landscape to produce a variety of experiences with views to eye-catcher features within the landscape, as well as borrowed views in the wider landscape. And you can see here at Chatsworth, above the formal terraces, the Brownian parkland with scattered trees rising up from the river and on, on to the woodlands in the distance. Creating Brown's landscapes was a massive undertaking, and some say Brown was in fact a vandal, destroying natural habitats to make way for his lakes and lawns and felling mature trees. But in fact, his approach at each site was different, and often his natural style landscapes provided a more varied habitat than the formal gardens or arable land he replaced. Here at Croom, um, which has recently been restored, you can get an idea of how Brown's landscapes would have appeared when they were first created. At some sites, he removed formal gardens and trees. At others, they had already been removed. He conserved many existing trees and woodlands and planted hundreds of new parkland trees and woodland that today are veteran and ancient trees or ancient woodland. Through large-scale groundworks and drainage, he removed natural wetland systems on quite a scale and wet grasslands, creating in their place open water bodies and dry grasslands. He expanded parklands, bringing in features in the wider landscape, including grazed common land, former medieval deer parks and arable land. And in doing so, he essentially conserved these areas from subsequent development or agriculture. And here at Croom, Brown extended the existing parkland by draining the surrounding marshy farmland. He incorporated outlying former deer parks and adapted an existing canal to look like a river. And by the way, the reeds in the river would have been removed for reflections of the house and other features at key viewpoints. So what habitats have been created by Brown landscapes? such as Longleat in Wiltshire here. The parkland features Brown incorporated into his designs, grassland, parkland trees, woodland, water bodies, and built structures, were arranged in an intricate pattern that created a varied habitat mosaic concentrated in one place. A study of 130 brown sites across England show they showed they collectively contained 12 priority habitats supported by the, these design features. And so he, he created a range of grassland habitats um, according to the pH of the soil. He um, created lowland and upland heath. He created woodland and pasture Wood, wood pasture and parkland habitat, traditional orchards, deciduous woodland, and reed beds, fens, mud flats, coastal floodplain, and grazing marsh. So collectively, in all of Brown sites, um, these habitats occur. And they're the habitats that are mostly associated with lowland England, which is where his sites predominantly occur. And these habitats support a wide range of species, and some of them are very rare or endangered. And of all of these habitats, the most significant found in brown sites are wood pasture and parkland habitat, deciduous woodland, lowland heath, undetermined grassland and reed beds. And they're significant because compared to the landscapes that surround his sites, they occur at more than double the density or concentration as in brown sites compared to the landscapes that surround them. And the same goes for ancient woodland, surface water bodies, and the varied woodland inventory types, including mixed broadleaf woodland 
and coniferous woodland. And of national significance, so perhaps most important of all, um, our protected sites for nature conservation, our sites of special scientific interest, which we call triple SIs, also occurred in brown sites collectively at more than double the density in brown sites compared to the landscapes that surround them. And then lastly, of particular interest, as we can see from the top um, line, wood pasture and parkland habitat was particularly prevalent at his sites, found 30 times more densely there than compared to the landscapes that surround them. But most of all, most, most important of all are the hundreds of parkland trees Brown planted within grazed pasture. So today they're around 300 years old and the existing trees he incorporated into his designs are up to 1,000 years old, dating back to the medieval period and beyond. And parkland trees with their open spreading branches and leaf laden canopies reach a very great age because they grow strong in open grazed areas, getting loads of sunlight and nutrients rather than competing for light and nutrients in woodland. They're really important, as this slide shows, for their dead and decaying wood mature barks and nooks and crannies that develop in old wood that a lot of species need to survive, particularly fungi, lichens and invertebrates such as beetles, flies and spiders, as well as providing roosts for bats. And this, and this slide shows the species they are particularly important for. Um, and as you can see, invertebrates and lichens are of those are the most important. So here we've got um, a, a, a pipe fly catcher from Moccas, um, together with some some of some of the many many rare beetles they, they that, that live there on the dead wood, and um, most striking is the bright red cardinal click beetle um, that likes to feed on hawthorn flowers. We've got bracket fungi growing on in the bark, the dead decaying bark on the right. And then in the bottom left, we've got the lemon tart lichen. This is a near threatened, nationally scarce and, and species of international responsibility. And um, at long leap, lichen, at long leap, the lichens probably um, are, are most prevalent and it's probably the largest known UK population. On the right, we've got the eagle's claw, descriptively named. And this is a classic parkland lichen. And it's an endangered species that lives on the enriched bark of mature trees and occasionally on calcareous old walls in well-lit situations. So these are the, the species that um, are really important within historic parklands, without which um, they would struggle to survive. And here's just a lovely slide I couldn't resist showing you of um, all our lichens. So I'm now going to talk to you a bit about ecological connectivity, which is the ability for species to move or be moved between habitats. And the greater the ability of species to move or be moved between habitats, the greater their chances of survival and adaptation to changing conditions. The study of the predominant parkland habitats and associated species at five brown sites shown here indicated that ecological connectivity with brown sites is generally high. The way Brown designed his landscapes using natural features arranged in an intricate pattern provided, provides us with a mosaic of complementary habitats. They're close together relatively, they have lengthy edge habitat, making it easy to move between habitats and important for many species, especially those that need a variety of conditions for feeding, breeding, hibernating, life cycle changes. For example, I can think of dragonflies, newts, and bats. The study showed that connectivity to the wider landscape, which is usually more intensively managed far, farmland or urban areas, was found to be generally not as strong and very variable. So in conclusion, the, the frequency of brown sites across England, together with our other 
historic designed landscapes and other areas of wood pasture means they provide stepping stones for species to connect with similar habitats in the wider landscape, particularly with woodland and where connected by waters such as river, rivers. They are important for species that need large water body, bodies, which are relatively rare in the wide, wider landscape, and for more mobile species. For less mobile species, especially those dependent on deadwood habitat in wood pasture and parkland, including fungi and lichens and, and soil biology, eco ecological connectivity is, is still very, under, very uh, poorly understood, and we need to learn a lot more to manage for their survival. So this is the second part of my talk, which is really talking about ecosystem services in Brown's landscapes. And it gives a wider perspective of their place in the landscape and the wider environment. Brown designed his landscapes for the pleasure and display of his wealthy clients and as productive landscapes around 300 years ago. But how relevant are they for us today in the 21st century, apart from as beautiful places and museums of the past, which is how we, on the whole, tend to think of them? The ecosystem services approach helps us understand and value the benefits the natural environment provides for our health and well-being. This table, based on a study of 25 historic designed landscapes, including five designed by Brown, so parkland features collectively, shown in the left two columns, contribute to a wide range of ecosystem services. And those, those are listed across the top um, in the green, purple and turquoise columns. And these services are in particular represented by the prevalence, the columns with the most dots are gen genetic diversity, regulation of climate, regulation of water quality and water flow, our sense of history and place, and biodiversity. They also provide food, timber, and water. They regulate soil quality and op offer opportunities for recreation to observe and to observe the underlying geology. And to give you a flavor of what this actually means, I'm going to mention a, a few of these um, ecosystem services in brief. So gen genetic diversity. Brown sites house a valuable genetic bank for medicinal and scientific purposes, ranging from the national tree and plant collections they contain, the biology of undisturbed soils, which particularly in ancient woodland, the pure native species, including medieval deer herds and ancient trees dating back to the medieval period and, and beyond as well as the seed banks they provide for restoring wildlife habitats, as well as strains that may be resistant to disease and climatic variation in the future. In terms of pollination, pleasure gardens and parkland habitats provide a wide range of flowering species to feed pollinating insects such as bees and moths, and this they do over a much extended season compared to other places. And this is really important to help pollinate the crops in the surrounding farmland that we need to um, eat and feed our animals with. In terms of the regulation um, services they provide, large areas of, water, of mature woodland, grassland and water body sediments store or, observe, or absorb carbon and contribute thereby to climate cooling. And they help regulate water quality um, through their continuous cover woodland, especially where it has a healthy understory and good ground cover, where there is uncompacted permanent grassland. And this all helps absorb rainfall, reduce sedimentation and nutrient runoff into our rivers and streams. And as well as this, water bodies trap sediment and pollutants that are carried in along our rivers and streams. Parklands reduce flooding by their seasonal and temporary storage of water. And this is particularly important during high rainfall and slowing down. And, they, and, and again, the, the grasslands and the woodlands help slow down runoff 
into our rivers and streams so that that, that helps prevent flooding further downstream. In terms of sense of place, they're distinctive landscapes. Um, national character area profiles and landscape assessments describe them as high quality, designed, ornamental, mature and well-managed landscapes. They're quite different from surrounding landscapes with a mosaic of habitats and, they, and in themselves they contribute a key characteristic to our, natural, our national landscape character. And they add a well-wooded appearance to the surrounding landscapes, which um, makes, makes uh, our landscapes overall look much more wooded than they might otherwise appear. They've provided inspiration to notable artists and writers, which we all enjoy. And Brown and the English landscape style has wi widely influenced the design of landscapes all around the world, and it continues to do so. Brown sites provide a rich sense of history. They've got this ongoing association with ancestral ownership, which is unusual, with historical figures. And they provide us with ongoing opportunities um, to engage in contemporary cultural events. Um, some of you, for example, may have been to festivals there. Um, they, they have within them archaeological and historical features, including medieval deer parks, ancient woodland and habitats. And they provide us a, with an archive of past land use, particularly medieval, for example, or going further back. And many have conservation designations to protect them from scheduled monuments, register parks and gardens, and listed buildings, indicating how they are important to us today. And as I've already talked about, in terms of biodiversity, brown sites support a wide range of habitats and species. Some of them are very rare or endangered. And they're associate, these habitats are associated with grazed pasture, with trees, woodland and water bodies. And I've explained their significance for supporting much of the UK's wood pasture and parkland habitat, together with historic designed landscapes and areas of wood pasture as a whole. And together, they hold the most important concentration of ancient oak trees in northwest Europe. And so this is in particularly important for the niche species associated with dead wood, the fungi, the lichens, the invertebrates. And these are the species which require long-term habitat continuity and stability. And without that, they would die out. And finally, they support ecological survival by providing refuges for wildlife within more intensively managed or developed farmland and urban landscapes that surround them. And they provide stepping stones to con connect species with habitats in the wider landscape. And um, on a more personal level for people, relatively easy access means that they provide good opportunities to observe wildlife and get involved in habitat surveys and management. So to give you an idea of what the ecosystem services at one site, Sion Park in Greater London, here Brown made the river a focus of the landscape, pioneering, pioneering views to and across the river. And this was a new way to appreciate the natural landscape. Before that, the uh, Sion Park and the house, it had been very introvertedly focused into just the land around it as formal gardens. The parkland contributes to flood management. It provides temporary water storage to reduce flooding in the surrounding urban area, which is really a really important um, attribute of parklands in urban areas. And you can see the number of parklands in the slide are showing the white areas or the green areas. Um, and so they're a, they're a really important resource in urban areas in terms of flooding. And in urban areas, they're really an important part of the urban network of green spaces because they, they provide people with opportunities for health and recreation, um, which is obviously relatively sparse within built up areas. And at Scion, it's one of the few places greater in, in Greater London people can actually experience nature. They can see cattle grazing, they can see overwintering snipe on the riverbanks. And the parkland is the only area with tidal meadows and one of the few areas with natural banks and mudflats. So the parkland has 
conserve these habitats in the Thames in Greater London, which is quite unusual. And they support a wide variety of mud flat and wet woodland habitats and species. And some of them are really rare, including the German hair, hairy snail, which has a lovely name. And it's for these habitats and species that um, part of the park, which is the bit um, cross-hatched in orange, has been designated um, Cyan Park Triple SI to conserve it for nature conservation. The ancient trees and woodland at Cyan are important for roosting sites for bats, and they use the River Thames for foraging and as a wildlife corridor so that they can connect with other sites, um, including the parklands on the rivers, as well as up the, the wiggly blue tributaries you can see in the slide. Um, so there's nearby Richmond Park down in the bottom right and Osterley Park top left. Within the parkland, there are areas of formal gardens and mown lawns, but most of the plant parkland is actually managed as species-rich rough wood pasture uh, and dead and decaying wood is retained. So in, Cyan really shows how parklands, even in urban areas, can be managed for a wide range of environmental um, benefits that we need to survive. So in conclusion, um, I've collected some thoughts on Brown's legacy, which are allied to the three key strands of Natural England's new conservation strategy for the environment, really to give them to give us a wider perspective and put Brown's sites in the context of the environment as a whole. And so the first point um, is that Brown designed his landscapes to be multifunctional, um, to be for people and for productivity. And they continue to be relevant in the 21st century, as I've discussed, some 300 years since he was born. And we need to improve our understanding and therefore how we value these landscapes, both at the site level and the wider landscape scale. Um, and we need to do this so that, so that we can manage them to continue to provide the environmental benefits we need for our health and well-being. And without providing the resources to do this, um, they will not survive. The second point is brown landscapes have stood the test of time um, through long-term stability and good, good multifunctional management, which we can learn from. And to endure as resilient landscapes, which are what we need, they need our protection and management. And finally, the third point, brown sites are complex and fascinating. Um, brown designed his landscapes for people. And I think Brown's greatest legacy is that he changed the way we interact with landscape. He enabled people to appreciate the wider landscape and its natural features and to get out there and explore them. And brown landscapes today provide fabulous opportunities to experience landscape and benefit from healthy recreation, especially where good public access is available, where open days, events, nature-based and physical activities are offered, and where volunteers and professionals can engage in research or interpretation or hands-on management, depending what they're interested in, and where all all people from all walks of life are encouraged to join in. So like Brown, we need to put, put people at the heart of landscape, because without this, many of Brown's landscapes and the landscapes we need in our day-to-day -day life will not survive. And I'm just going to leave you um, with uh, a slide about the Capability Brown Festival which um, has helped make the most of Brown's le legacy. This is what the aim of the festival was really to meet those three um, points in the previous slide. And uh, this slide gives a flavour of what's been happening this year alongside new research such, such as this to help us make sure Brown's landscapes are flourishing and relevant for everyone today and that they survive into the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lizzie. I was listening in the other room the whole time and I was trying to get feeding back and nodding and uh, like, like I was Thank like you very much. Oh, well, let me just, I'll leave that up on the screen.
thing for you. Just send yourself to um, sit down this email if you've got any questions. If you have any help now, you don't have time um, to ask this now. Um, but if you do, then you can um, send yourself to me on the email and I'll send you the link to the um, to the email so you can get in touch with me. Um, so yeah, that's the um, that's the email that I'm going to send you to go over any points we made that you want to expand upon or just anything you've been kind of to ask anyone from DLI, the Edward Brown Festival team here or um or Leslie Beeman or any 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 of those and um now's the time to kind of go through it. Um da -da -da -da. just I'm just going to open up the question box now and have a little read through. Um I think there's a few of these studies that's fine. Um I um, David, uh, David um, we will have all of the presentations being recorded and it will be uploaded onto YouTube and embedded on our website so you can see, you can see the slides. Um, that's, that's yeah, really yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, that's yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, yeah, that's fine. Anything else? Um, oh, question from Simon. Uh -huh. um, you've, you've put me in an awkward spot there, Simon. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very interested to look at it and see how it allies with um, the research we've, we've carried out. Just for everybody else there, this is um, the Lambeth Institute of Political Notes on Ecological Corridors. Um, so actually, this is great. For me to yes. We'll get uh, Simon from the Lambeth Institute to so over to Leslie and you know, it's, it's actually a really important part because without these ecological corridors across the whole landscape, um, our wildlife are going to have a much lesser chance of surviving. And because our, our countryside has been so developed, intensively managed for farmland, for, for food, um, or developed for places for people to live and work, it means that wildlife have very few places to, to be, really, places for wildlife. So the more we can strengthen these few remaining habitats and connect them, the better chance our wildlife has to survive. Just a note now to say, I know a few of you have been struggling with uh, the sound quality. Often when there's this bad weather, you know, all around the UK, it does, we found a real correlation with it. I know there's been snow in some places and Ending. So, but from our end, I was listening in on another room, and we got a perfectly clear um, audio recording of this. So, for anyone that found it a little bit of a struggle, it's been perfectly recorded, and that will be the one that is used uh, on the website there. Um, Simon, uh, so that's that's that from the technical note. But Simon also tells us this is Simon at our head of the Landscape Institute says. Uh, we also have a note on ecosystem services. Um, and then Phil writes in with a question for Leslie. Where did Brown get his inspiration? We know he knew Marcus what inspired his understanding of the net, of, of that that we want to return to. Well, it's amazing, although everybody knows about Brown, we actually know very little about Brown. Um, he, he, he was born um, up near Kopal, um, and obviously, that's in Northumberland, so he often obviously experienced the environment there, and it is quite wild and rugged up there. So up on the higher uplands, and kind of the remnants of what our wild woodland would have looked like, which is this scatter of mature, well, open-grown trees, so with the spreading branches, um, patches of woodland, and patches of open glade. So there's this this natural mosaic. So. We, he, he may have he may have seen this, and that would have influenced partly his his interest in in that kind of landscape and, and how he could reproduce it in his sites. Hmm. Okay, fantastic. So we've got another question from Bern Eden or E. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce that. Um, in the Palm Shrine Sound Park. Oh, we just jumped around here. Sorry, I'm going to do. Oh, we've got lots of questions flying in. This is fantastic. Um, let me just come back to here. In the Bandstone Sion Park, can you explain what blue and green squares it takes? Right. Can we get? Can we go to that slide? Where is it? Is it? Yep.
Oh, oh sorry. Was, probably, yeah. I'm guessing there. So the blue and green squares, um, I can't remember, but what those all, all kind of represent are the designations. So just looking at Cyan, I think the red must be the listed buildings, I think. Um, the blue, mm, no, I, I can't, um, I can't remember. Sorry, it was a few years since there was a... kind of try and do all the time and um, every I think it's understanding that every site is different there's no one answer but it the first challenge is to get all the layers of information about why a, a site is significant from its biodiversity interest how the water is, is managed around the site how the climate affects the site as well as how people use the site um, and and the you know whether there's designations be they triple SI or whatever, um, and then having really understood the site, like we're all guilty of just understanding the site from our individual expertise, and we need to think about people, and we need to think about wildlife not in a negative way or conserving history not in a negative way, but seeing how it actually helps create what is interesting, and this is this is the approach of landscape design and this is why Brown was so, so successful is that he managed at each site to do something that worked together. Now obviously um, we're in the environmental field we're looking for semi-natural habitats or habitats that are managed like that and at many sites we can see kind of very closely trimmed lake borders or um, look, mown um, lawns and parkland Whereas what we want to see is sort of a variety of um, grasslands, flowering meadows, um, and, and sheep walks, and all these things Brown kind of had in his designs. He incorporated them in. And I think owners and managers are increasingly understanding that perhaps they can, that, that they can, they can manage their landscapes in different ways and, and things like environmental stewardship are helping fund that. So it's, yes, each site is different and um, there are conflicts, but on the whole, you can come up with an interesting site for nature and people. Um, so Simon, um, well, this is really, the Environment Agency is obviously very interested in um, managing water and they're working a lot with us about how to manage water um, to prevent flooding and to improve water quality because that costs a lot of money to the taxpayer. So yes, there's a huge amount of interest. I think there's there's not been so much interest and I've not heard of any projects with the Environment Agency specifically about historic parklands and this is the important thing about historic parklands is that I think for too long they've just been um, thought of as a kind of contained site, a kind of island, whereas in fact they're part of the whole wider environment and we need to be looking at them, yes, as part of the component of the whole managing a catchment on a catchment scale. Oh, okay, right. Um, okay, uh, Simon says thanks for that. That's good. Okay, yeah. That's me. 
Okay. okay. We'll have one more minute for any questions to come through. Um, so I'm sorry again if there's any sound quality issues, but yes, there will be a feedback form coming through. So if you do have any questions, then that is your opportunity to send them through. Um, or myself, or Leslie's email address, or anyone at the LI, if you've got any questions on this, we can surely answer those for you at a later date. Um, this will be recorded and put up on the website, so there is no rush to, this is not uh, now or never, and um, you've always got future opportunities to get in contact. So if there are no more questions to be asked, we can wrap this up, we just go back into this. Um, hopefully that's answered this question. Yep, thank you very much. Lovely. Yep. I just thought, um, going back to the challenges of balancing biodiversity with other interests question, um, we, we part of the Open Brown School, we went, ran a design competition for landscape Institute professionals and students. And that's for um, a site that's within a registered park and garden. And it's um, next to a National Nature Reserve and Triple SI, which is the old wood pasture and parkland habitat, the old um, deer park within the park and garden, within the brown landscape. And basically, we've working with the um, National Nature Reserve, um, my colleagues, um, explaining to people why the site was important from all sorts of perspectives. We came up with a fabulous design that, that actually is restoring the wood pasture and parkland and creating a, a space that people want to come and visit and through that support the whole site through volunteering, their interest, maybe funding, for, for example. And we had an open day in May and we were people turned up and this is a site, a tiny site, this well known, well in well in the kind of back back parts of um Herefish countryside. And I was just amazed at how two hundred people came and spent all day listening to us explaining the archaeology, biodiversity, um about brown and design. And they were absolutely um kind of delighted by the site. And it had fabulous views over the surrounding countryside and they were really enthusiastic about coming back to visit or to learn or to get involved. So that's that's sort of one example and, and there are many others of how we can balance um, all, all the different interests of our landscapes. Wonderful. Um, Simon also wants to add and, and show the wing here and the Caitlin Brown team in the office has volunteered this opportunity to Tell them that there's several other books uh, on Brown that have been published, um, and we have copies here if anybody uh, would like to buy one. Um, actually, goes into more about what Simon was saying about Brown's connection to water. Um, it's David uh, Brown and his landscape gardens. All right, thank you very, very much to everybody that's joined us today and held with us through some bad audio. And we very much appreciate your attendance. We really appreciate your questions, and we hope that um, you enjoy it for today. We just uh, let you know anybody here in the wider membership that's interested. Next week's uh, webinar is on university accreditation accredited courses for landscape architecture. But on the 17th of November, following on from that, on the 1st of December, we have a webinar about invisible fencing for conservation and grazing. And on the December, we're back with the Brown theme for another webinar. This is the Potter and Fonder Sensory Experience at Crew. And there are the webinars that are coming up. So thank you once again. Thank you to Leslie. Thank you very much for listening. That was really good. And see you next week. Thank you. Bye.